Good morning and welcome to the services at the College Church. It is a blessing for us to be together. If you're visiting with us, thank you so much for coming. We'd encourage you to take one of the Connect cards in the back of the pew in front of you and fill that out either by hand and put it in one of the collection plates or you can scan a QR code and fill that out online. Our members can do the same thing to share announcements or prayer requests. There's also a QR code on your order of worship if you'd like, ac like access to our church bulletin. Let me share with you some family news. Our brother Fred Jewell remains in great need of your prayers. He has been moved to Unity Health room 3410. That's the fourth floor north side and visitors are welcome. All those who completed reading the Bible in 2022 are invited to a luncheon in the family room on Sunday, February the 5th, immediately following our Bible classes. Please RSVP to the church office by Monday, January 30th to let them know if you would prefer steak or chicken. But do not call tomorrow because the church office will be closed in honor of the holiday. Our final announcement, uh, the elders have asked us to emphasize once again that with the um, increased costs for heating and electricity this season, the College Church elders are concerned that some members may be having difficulty paying their bills. So we want to help if you or any other member of the congregation that you know of needs some assistance with above normal utility costs, please contact your shepherding group elder or the church office. As we enter into our worship, please hear these words from Psalm 135. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise him, O you servants of the Lord. You who stand in the house of the Lord in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is pleasant. Let's be standing for our first song this morning. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus fled.
Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6. I'll be reading from the NIV. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for an opportunity to be here together this morning. Uh, We're so thankful for the chance to come together, and we ask that you be with those that weren't able to be here this morning, and we ask you to to bless them. We're mindful of those that can't be here because of of sickness, because of illness. Uh, We're especially mindful of uh, Fred Jewell and the Jewell family. We ask you to to bless him and to bless those that are working with him. Lord, we're thankful that we can come and and study your word and learn from your word, and we ask that you be with uh, those speaking with us today about uh, spiritual growth, and we ask that we'll be able to to listen and learn and and gain uh, from their insight. Uh, Lord, just continue to be with us in all the different activities we're involved in and continue to bless us. And be with us as we worship you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's a blessing to be here this morning. And and it's always exciting uh, whenever all of our college students come back from break. uh, And we have so many here with us. My name is, is Grant Fitzhugh, and I'm the kind of uh, new full-time college minister here at College Church. Noel asked me if I could share one thing with our congregation and the college students today, what would it be? And I feel similar to Paul in some ways when he writes to the Philippians, it's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it's a safeguard for you, um, because I'm going to keep saying what I, I've been saying, because when something is important... We need to hear it often. I've heard before that we need to preach the gospel to ourselves every day because we need to be reminded every single day. And I think that that's true. So if someone were to drive by the college class, they would probably hear me at some point talking about being disciples of Jesus and making disciples of Jesus because that's what we want our culture to be in the college ministry where being disciples who make disciples is our way of life. And because sometimes people can maybe have a lot of different definitions of what a disciple is, we use a definition taken from Matthew 4.19. A disciple of Jesus is someone who is following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and is committed to the mission of Jesus. And that's who we want to be. And so, as Noel has been talking some about spiritual growth the past couple weeks, that is a really big part of being a follower of Jesus, being a disciple of Jesus, is growing in following him, growing in being changed like him, becoming more like him, growing in being fishers of people, growing in in being committed to his mission. And so, in the college ministry, to help us live out this mission, we have a few values that we seek to live out, and we call these, we are his. And within that phrase, there are five values represented. But the one that we're going to focus on this morning is we, because I think it's so important to all of this. Now, you might say, okay, how is we a value? (laughs) That doesn't make much sense. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that. In the college ministry, a phrase that we like to say a lot is, discipleship is a we thing, not a me thing. 
I think that we live in a culture where people often believe that they can be a disciple of Jesus on their own. That just my personal relationship with God is all that matters, and so I don't really need anyone else in that because it's just between me and God. And hopefully, because you're here today, that isn't you. Because I think that that is a lie, that I can be a follower of Jesus all on my own. It's a lie that Satan uses to isolate individuals, to keep them from growing in their relationship with God. Because I think we truly need each other. Jesus didn't just come to die and and rise again to save a lot of individuals. Jesus died to save his bride, the church. And when we reject that discipleship is a me thing and we really buy into living out following Jesus as a we thing in community, then we will experience the power of the Holy Spirit working through that. Hebrews chapter 3 verses 12 and 13 say, take care brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. If we aren't in this together, our hearts will harden. We need each other in this journey. Discipleship, spiritual growth, it's a we thing, not a me thing. Turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And let's just read together verses 15 and 16. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is talking about the church growing towards spiritual maturity. And I actually love how it's put right here of growing up in every way of him who is into him who is the head into Christ. Basically, um, I have this picture when he describes it. It's like if we are the body and Christ is the head, then he's telling us, hey, don't be a bobblehead church. As Christ's body, we are to grow into Christ likeness, to become like him, to do what he did. And we are to be his, his actual, his hands and his feet, his body on this earth. But too often it's like we are a child's body that, that hasn't grown into the head, that hasn't grown into Christ. But he tells us here how we're supposed to grow together. We need each other in order to grow. Because He gave the church leaders, verse 11 says, not to make the body grow all on their own, but to equip the saints for the work of ministry so that we are all building each other up. Verse 16 says that we will only grow when each part is working properly. Basically, we all need each other and each other's gifts to be able to be who God wants us to be. Verse 13 says that the outcome of our growth will be unity, maturity, and Christ-likeness. I think that these are three things that we desperately need in our world today. But that will only happen when discipleship is a we thing. And I've seen this in my own life. The times when I've been plugged in to a group of guys who are trying to seek the Lord and grow in Him together is when I've experienced the most growth in my own life, in my own spiritual walk. Late nights uh, in Allen dorm spent pouring out our hearts to each other and praying over each other have impacted me forever. And so that's why in the college ministry we do things like game nights or uh, study nights watching The Chosen. 
That's why we want people to get a name tag and, and get to know each other. That's why we encourage things like the Adopt a College Student program that we're just starting. Because we believe that if we are intentionally connected to each other, it will help us be more closely connected to God. But we can't lose that word intentionally. Because we can be connected to each other without growing spiritually. We can come to church and, and maybe know a couple hundred people's names without actually intentionally growing in the Lord with anyone. I'm so excited that this semester we have eight new discipleship groups starting up. This semester led by college students. And that, that's an enormous win for us. And, and I want to celebrate that because what gets celebrated gets repeated. And so I, I am so excited about these new discipleship groups that are starting up. Because that's a lot of young people who realize that they need each other. And they are being intentional about connecting with each other so that they can grow spiritually. These groups are full of Christians who are at every stage in their walk with God. And they're uh, full of some non-Christians as well. In those discipleship groups, there is a whole lot of Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love, which Paul says is how we grow up in every way into Christ. And so whether you're a college student or not, Jesus doesn't want us to be a bobblehead church. He wants us to grow up in every way into him, into unity, maturity, and Christ-likeness. And we can only do that with each other's help. Discipleship Spiritual growth, it's a we thing, not a me thing. If you're involved with children's worship, you can head that direction as we sing two songs before communion. <laughs> Jesus said that if I thirst, I should.
Good morning, College Church. The title of my communion comments this morning is A Reflection Worth Remembering. You know, there are very few things in my life that speak truth to me like a mirror. If there's a moment when I feel like I have movie star looks or attributes, all I have to do is look in a mirror and, and I'm reminded of the truth. I don't. Over the past 16 years, throughout my physical transformation of losing 160 plus pounds, it has been a mirror that has reminded me that I don't look like I used to. There are days when I feel like I have those extra 160 pounds on me, and in my mind's eye, I still see myself as that person. But then, I look in a mirror, and I'm reminded that that's false, that those are lies, and I don't even recognize myself. In my estimation, one of the best ways to defeat a lie is to reflect on the truth. And today, as we come to this moment in our worship, and we're readying our minds to reflect on what may be arguably the most reflective time during our worship, the Lord's Supper, I want you to pause, clear your minds as best you can, and to think. Now, you may have a hard time reflecting on yourself and your relationship with Christ this morning at this moment. You may be feeling this, the sense of worthlessness. You may be sinking in the shame of a sin that's eating away at your life. You may feel at this moment that no one cares about you. So why would God care about me either? Then others of you may see God more clearly than you ever have before. You may be healing from the wounds of the past and knowing today the power of the cross is greater in your life than it ever has been. Well, regardless of where you are in this moment, and I know we're all over the place, I want you to reflect on this truth during this time. So for just a moment, I invite you to imagine. Imagine you are looking into a mirror. And in that mirror, you see your reflection. But you also see the reflection of Jesus. With both of his hands, scarred with nail holes, on your shoulders, behind you, looking into that same mirror. And I believe in this moment, here's what he would say to you. And these are Jesus' words from, Mark, from John chapter 12, verse 27 and 28. Jesus says, remember this, now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. You see, in this passage, Jesus, in the same breath of predicting his death, he becomes so overwhelmed about what is about to take place that he has this moment of doubt. But almost at the same time, in that very breath, He remembers you. He remembers me. He remembers us. You are the very reason He came to this earth. You are the very reason He came to sacrifice Himself for your sins. Jesus at this moment, is looking over your shoulders and says, reflect on this truth. Jesus embodied, suffered, and died on the cross so that you, we, could embody and receive eternal life. Jesus did not, has not, and will not ever turn away from you. When there are times that Satan tries to have you to believe that you are worthless and simply the summation of your sins, look into that mirror See Jesus and know that He died for you so that you could have freedom in Him. Now, that's the truth. And it's a reflection worth remembering. Let's go to God in prayer. God, we love you. And as we come to this reflective time in our worship, God, where we picture you and see your Son, Jesus, on the cross, 
God, I pray that during this time as we take this bread that is Jesus' broken body, that we will know that Jesus' body was not broken on that cross in vain. It was broken on that cross as a choice by you and Him to save us from our sins. God, there are so many times where we feel worthless. There are so many times where we feel left alone. But God, in those times, may we reflect on the truth that you sent your Son, your one and only Son, to die for us and that Jesus was a willing sacrifice. As we take this bread, God, may we remember that truth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's pray for the cup. God, again, we come humbled and grateful that you would send your son Jesus to die for us. God, I pray now as we reflect on the truth of Jesus' sacrifice for us to save us from our sins, that we can picture the blood on the cross that was shed for us. Blood shed again, not in vain, but so that we could have eternal life with you. And God, no matter what we face today, tomorrow, or the next day, we know that the battle, the war, is already won in Jesus. And God, I pray that we can stick close to you, follow you, and impact others to be more like you. God, thank you for this fruit of the vine, which represents that blood. And may we take it in a way that remembers you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now we come to a time in our worship that focuses on giving and sacrifice from our own account. I have a, the unique privilege, and I count it a very, very, very much a privilege of working with the college church now in my 13th year. And in my role now, I get to see on a daily basis the sacrifices that you all make, whether it be monetarily, whether it be giving of your time, your energy and effort, whether it be praying, whatever it may be. I count that a tremendous privilege to see the sacrifices that are made by this congregation in order to help the good works of this congregation and ultimately building the kingdom to be more impactful. So I want to say thank you. But at this time, we have, a, we have an opportunity to give back. And as you know, there's the options on the screens. There's also the boxes that are located at different points throughout the building. And just want to say thank you because the sacrifice that God gave for us, that Jesus gave for us, pales in comparison to the sacrifice that we offer to Him. But we get to join in on that sacrifice by giving back. And however it is that you give back, and I'm assuming and I know it's multiple ways, thank you for serving God, thank you for believing in His mission, and thank you for helping the college church help build the kingdom. Let's go to God in prayer. God, we love you and we thank you for loving us. God, we thank you for giving us the means to live our lives in a way, God, that hopefully fully reflect you. God, may every dollar that we have may be a decision come behind that and how that impacts our relationship and ultimately the relationship of others with you. God, as we set aside in our hearts and our minds about what we give today, 
I pray a blessing on this giving. I'm thankful for this, for this giving and this opportunity that we have to participate in the sacrifice of your son Jesus. And God, may we see these as monetary funds that may be given today or to our time, our energy and effort. May we see this as things, as opportunities to build the kingdom. And God, I pray that the funds that are collected here today and throughout the week will be used to build the kingdom. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for taking care of us and, and saving us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If it's convenient for you, let's stand one more time before Mr. Noel brings us the message. Come now, fount of every blessing. this morning. I appreciate all the men, appreciate all the men who have led us so wonderfully in worship. Grant, thank you for the words that you shared earlier. Um, I'm going to take those words a little bit further now, just another step, and talk about how we allow that spiritual growth to happen. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 4, and we'll begin in just a moment in verse 1. Ephesians 4. I also want to welcome our college students. I know some of you were here uh, last week, but more of you are here in droves this week, and we're glad that you're among us and part of this church, and we hope you have a great semester. I know it began this past week, and we hope you have a great new year. Thank you for being a part of the service. All of you, thank you, and especially those of you who are our guests this morning. Have you ever watched little children in church? Have you ever, maybe you've sat somewhere and there was a, a young family be, before you and uh, right in front of you and, and they had small children or maybe they had a, a two-year-old or a three-year-old. Have you ever watched them in church? They get away with murder compared to you and me. I mean, they're, they'll stand up on the back of the pew and look around and look at everybody. I never get to do that. Do you? No, but littles. The small kids do, and they eat honey nut Cheerios, and they have those goldfish snacks, and, and I, I, you don't get to snack, do you? And they, they take naps during church, during my sermon. Now, some of you also nap, but you do it, <laughs> they do, they, they do it horizontally. You do it vertically. You know, that's a little bit of the difference. 
things that little, small children do that don't surprise us would greatly surprise us if we saw that in grown-up people, teenagers, college students, those of us who are more mature even than that, and go as far as I'm going to go. Would it surprise you if I told you that when I came in this morning, I saw a couple of deacons in the back playing patty cake? It, it might not surprise you, but it should, because that, that doesn't happen. We don't expect that. In fact, if we saw them cutting out paper dolls or playing patty cake, we would think there's a problem there. Because somewhere along the way, we're supposed to grow up and mature and do things differently than we did when we were small children. Kids get away with murder in, in church, but you and I, we have a different expectation about us. Not only just in church on Sunday morning, but in the kingdom of God in church every day of the week. God has an expectation of us that we will grow up in the Lord. That's what this text in Ephesians 4 is all about. How we can know if we're growing, if we're becoming more spiritually grown up and equipped. It's a we thing. In fact, that title isn't my title. That title belongs to Grant. He called me this week and said, I think the part of my lesson that I want to talk about, spiritual growth, it's a we thing. And the more I thought about it, that should have been the title of my part of the lesson. It is a we thing because unless I'm growing up, Unless I'm doing the things that spiritually mature people are doing, I can't expect to be helping anyone else to be growing. Or if, and he alluded to this, if I'm in an environment where the people, the men and women, brothers and sisters around me are not growing spiritually, if we're not in a family that is growing spiritually, it is increasingly more difficult for me to be able to grow spiritually because it's a we thing. It's something that we do together and we help one another in doing. And so come to Ephesians chapter 4, and Paul begins to talk about the spiritual growth happens in your thinking process, in your attitude, where your mind is about some things. And he's writing to the church in Ephesus from a prison cell in Rome, and he lists for us some characteristics that all of us, we all need to share in if we're going to be a church that is growing up in the Lord. Now, if I'm not growing in these areas, then I'm not helping anyone else to grow in these areas. We are in this together. It's a we thing. And and the And you see the list of things that he says that we need to be growing in, in our humility and our gentleness, our patience, our ability to love one another. And that all results more and more in the unity. And when we have unity in this church, then the ability for you to grow, for me to grow, just exponentially increases. And so he begins to talk about the humility. Being humble... Is not a, it's not a selective thing in your life. It's a mandatory trait for a child of God. And so he, he lists for us the first thing about a spiritually grown. And this is, we're not going to talk about an exhaustive list, but this list that he gives us is a good place to begin. These are the very basics, and humility is one of them. So are you a humble person? I mean, are you more concerned about the needs, the hurts, the pains of other people? Or are you the kind of person that always needs to be first in everything? People need to be paying attention to you, not you paying attention to them. And so you put yourself on a, on a continuum. These two extremes from utter humility or utter pride. Where are you on that continuum? Are you more concerned about the needs of other people? Do you, do you come into a place like this and start looking around for maybe someone who's sitting by themselves that you can go by and say, hey, come sit with me or can, can, can I sit with you? Do you come in here and, and you're, are you looking for someone that you know is going through a difficult time in their life? Maybe a family who's really struggling right now. Do you come in here looking for them so that you can encourage them? See what you can do to help them. Or is your time here this morning all about me? 
and what I want and what people can do for me. So, and I'm not trying to be all overtly negative here, but just put yourself on the continuum. And I don't care where you are. I honestly don't. I don't care if you're a little bit more that way, a little bit more toward pride. I'm not as interested in where you are right now as I am in what direction are you going. Are you increasingly, gradually, systematically, through the help of God and His Holy Spirit and His holy people, are you becoming more humble or are you becoming more prideful? It's, it's the direction in all of these. I'm more concerned about, and I think God is, what direction are you headed? Gentleness. Because of the work of the Holy Spirit in you and the growth, the maturing, uh, maturing process that is occurring, are you becoming a more gentle person? Is it more natural for you to give people the benefit of the doubt? When you hear something negative, say, I don't, you know, I don't know about that. I just know what I see in this person, and, and I see good in them. Is it becoming more natural for you to give people the benefit of the doubt to see good, when, maybe when they make a mistake, to be quick to forgive them? Are you growing in that area to become more gentle and less harsh and abrasive with people? Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 1 says, A soft, or your translation may say, a gentle answer turns away wrath but a harsh word stirs up anger and i think about that old testament story of gideon gideon was that guy that was down in the threshing floor and he was hiding from the midianites he was a a, a scaredy cat and god made him this valiant warrior and so he goes in to fight the midianites with 300 if you can call them soldiers and, and they're armed with torches and, porch, uh, and, uh, and, and pitchers and, and not real weapons as we think about. And Gideon and the 300 rout the Midianites. And, and they're, they're chasing them out of the country. And while they're winning this battle, Gideon sends word to the Ephraimites, one of the Israelite tribes, to the tribe of Ephraim, come and help us, come help us finish these Midianites off. And he gives the Ephraimites, two of the kings of the Midianites, to put to death. And so when the battle is finally over in chapter 8 of Judges, the Ephraimites come to Gideon and they're miffed. They're upset. And they said, why have you treated us? Now keep in mind, Ephraim is the largest of the tribes. They're the most numerous and in that regard, they might think they're the most impressive, the most influential, they're the most important. I, I don't know altogether, but they are the largest. Why have you treated us this way, Gideon? I mean, you wait until the battle's nearly over, and you bring us in, and you, you just kind of let us, at the end of it, polish things off. And, and we don't think that was right. You should have called us in the very beginning, Gideon. And I love Gideon's response. He says, what have I done compared to you? I mean, without you, this battle couldn't have really gone the way it did. I mean, look how God used you. You killed the two Midianite kings. Anything I've done pales in significance compared to what you've done. Why, why the grapes in Ephraim are so much better than any of the grapes of any of the other tribes. Gideon would have made a tremendous politician. Uh, but, but what he's doing is he's got some people that are riled up and they're upset. And the last thing Gideon needs right now is, an, is another fight between his own people. And he knows that harsh words, which Gideon probably had a right to, to give. What do you... Don't you come here. You haven't done anything against the Midianites. God called me, and I did this, and he weaned us down to 300. And all. Don't you come in here thinking you're all that, because you're not. That would have only made things worse. Gideon knows that a gentle answer, a gentle word, can cool things down. And that's exactly what he does. And so on this continuum, again, I don't care where you are. Are you becoming more gentle 
Or are you getting increasingly more abrasive and harsh toward people? And more importantly, where would your spouse put you on this continuum? And what direction would he or she say you're going? Or your family, your kids? Would your kids say, Dad, Mom, we, we see you growing more gentle because of God's work in your life. Or are you getting more harsh, more demanding? Again, where, what direction are you headed? And we keep moving down the list. Patience. Do you lose your temper easily? Are you a quick trigger? Trigger? Do you always demand your way? Do you get frustrated when, when people around you are not doing exactly the way you think they need to be doing things? Is that a characteristic of you to get very frustrated and demanding of people who, who don't think and act and do just like you do? Patience. You would think that um, Patience would be, uh, you're just all out of control. That's not, that's not impatience. Sometimes you're not out of control. You're just thinking too much about the way you want it done. I like how someone defined patience this way. Patience is the, abil- patience is the ability to idle your motor when you feel like stripping your gears. That's patience. Maybe down deep, you may be feeling a whole lot more aggravated and frustrated than you let on. That's what patient people do. They don't always wear their emotions on their sleeve. They don't always feel like they have a right to give people a piece of their mind. So I want you to mark where you are on the continuum, on the line. Are you growing more patient? Or are you growing more impatient? And then love. I'm I'm a little confused as to why Paul didn't begin with love. Isn't Paul the one that said the greatest of these is love? Isn't Jesus the one that said that they will know you are my disciples, that you really are followers of mine if you love one another, I don't, I don't know why he doesn't begin with love, but you and I would agree that one of the greatest characteristics of people who are growing in the Lord is they are also growing in their love. Now, what's the difference, the, the opposite of love? You would almost think, shouldn't that be hate? No, because when you, when you hate, you still have feelings. There's still emotions there, you know, and, but the opposite of love is indifferent especially when people are different from you who don't do exactly the things exactly the way you want them and and there are a lot of people in the world that that a lot of folks are indifferent to they don't hate them they just don't care about them they can easily walk right on by and not help not serve not love and so that's why i say the opposite of loving someone is not hating them. It's just not caring. You don't care about them at all. Spiritually immature people can look at the plight of another person to see their hurt, to see the pain, to see the grief in their heart, and could, they couldn't care less. Just walk right on by. But people who are growing up in God, growing up in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus, people who are being come, becoming more and more spiritually mature by the work of the Holy Spirit, they know what love is. And love is not always an emotion where you feel good toward the other person. It's where you make the decision you're always going to do what's in the best interest of other people. And so people who love get involved. Now, they can't do everything, but they will do something. And in this church and... Um, Nick alluded to this also in the way that he has seen you sacrifice. People who are growing up in love, they will do something. Now, it may be giving some of their money. It may be even giving a little bit of money directly to someone uh, who's in a a real financial struggle right now. It may be that they 
volunteer disaster relief, uh, relief trips. Uh, they may work at the Judsonia warehouse. They may work in Karen and Sharing or at his house, but they give a little of their time to help the needs of others. It may be they invite someone, a visitor, a guest to their home. Hey, come home and eat with us today just to show kindness because here's a guest, maybe here for the first time, and they're in this big auditorium with all of these people and they still feel very alone. And maybe they need someone who will love them, who will come sit alongside of them, help them find a classroom, maybe just help them find their way out of the building. They can't do everything. They can't do everything for every person, but they can do something for someone. And people who grow up in love will always do something. But then here's where we really get to the we of the business when he talks about unity. Because he's saying that we're all in this together. And again, unless I'm growing in the Lord, I can't help you to grow. Unless you're growing in the Lord, you can't help others to grow. And so this is the we thing. In your conversations with other people, do you really focus on the common ground that you have? Or are you always pointing out the differences? Oh, the way they're so different from us and how we don't agree with them and, and what we don't like about them. Are you always looking for the common ground where we can come together and do the work of the Lord and we can love one another? Are you perceived more as a peacemaker or as one who stirs up trouble? I mean, you just have to kind of talk things into a, a, a bigger fire than they really need to be. A peacemaker or a troublemaker? Look at verse 3. Eager to maintain. Your translation may say, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I mean, is that, is that your desire? Is that your goal? That the unity of this body here at this place, or, or even in a smaller setting, whether it's your small groups, your Bible class, the, the people that you work with in, in the work of the church, are you eager to maintain the spirit of unity that exists among us. Because he goes on to say in verse 4 that there's one body, there's one spirit, there's one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. God is a God of oneness. And when you are growing in the Lord and the person next to you and the person behind you and the people in front of you, when we're all growing in the Lord, we may not be growing at the same rate, but we're all going in the same direction in these areas. The unity of the Spirit, it's a lot easier for me to maintain the unity of the Spirit when you're also doing the same. That's why Paul will write in Romans chapter 12, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with other people. Now, I, because you need my help and I need your help if we're all going to Keep the unity of this church together. The psalmist said this, How good and pleasant is it when brothers dwell together in unity. Psalms 133 and 1. How good it is when brothers and sisters, we come together and we dwell in unity. And I love the unity that we have in Circe among the, 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 our fellowship. Uh, the, the churches of Christ have a tremendous, whether it's, whether it's the end of the year service or vacation Bible school or some other things that we're doing. I'm especially proud of the unity that we have in this church between the elders and the staff. And, and, I, and, and going even deeper than that, I'm, I am ex, extremely proud of the unity that we have among our elders. And I've been in hundreds and hundreds of elders' meetings now. And I've seen them disagree. But I've never once seen them disrespect. Th th there are times they don't all agree. And not every decision is unanimous, but they have never dishonored anyone else in their, their meetings. They always stay patient, and they stay kind in their words. And even when they disagree, when they finally come to a conclusion, then all of these men leave that meeting, and they're unified on the, 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 uh, the decision. They don't go out, no, none of them go out there and say, well, now the elders decided something, but you know, I'm dead set against it. There's unity there. And I think that promotes when it's between the elders and the staff and the deacons and it, it extenuates into the teachers and the other people that are leading the women's groups and men's groups and small groups. 
how wonderful it is when brothers, and look around, who are so different, and they're all on different places in their spiritual growth, but they are still dwelling together in unity. When the church is divided, the Lord is diminished. And when the church is unified, God is glorified. That's what Paul is saying. It's about your attitudes and the way you think. But it's also spiritual growth happens in your actions. I mean, the things that you do. Someone says, what are God's gifts to you? Well, what, what you are, that's God's gift to you. How you use what he's given, that's your gift to him. And so we all have abilities and talents and we all have our strengths and our weaknesses. Ephesians 4, verse 11 and 13. And he gave some to be apostles and prophets and evangelists, the pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for the building up of the body of Christ until we all, we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and, and, and to mature manhood. He's not trying to be sexist there. He's talking about being an adult. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So what you do in using your gifts, that helps all of us. When you're teaching, when you're leading singing, when you're preaching, when you're serving, when you're inviting, when you're using whatever gifts God gives you, it's helping all of us to grow up in the Lord. But then there's your ambitions. Spiritual growth happens in your ambitions. What is it you really want? What is it that is your real goal in life, your longing and your prayer? Ephesians 4, verses 14. We're no longer infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, we're not like, that's kind of the way the world works. They're scheming all the time to see who can get ahead. Instead, here's what happens in the kingdom of God. We speak the truth, but we don't do it harshly. We do it in love. We will in all things grow up into him who is the head. That is Christ. That's our goal. To become more and more like our head, Christ. To, to have his image stamped deep on our heart. To become more and more like Jesus. Have you ever been to a fair or a circus or, or to the beach and you see one of those cutouts of a strong man and they got the big hole right there above the shoulders where you, you can go behind there and you can put your head through that hole and, and, and now you've got this face on this very muscular body. The problem is the body doesn't really look like the head. And that's exactly what Paul is talking about. He wants the body to look like the head of the church, and that's Christ. Some of you have been Christians only for a few weeks. Some of you have been Christians for a few months. Maybe some of you only for a few years, and a lot of growth needs to occur in your life. I hope you have a tremendous amount of people who are humble and gentle and patient and loving around you because that's how you're going to grow up but some of us we've been christians for 10 20 30 50 years so the question is do you look a whole lot more like jesus than you did when you were first baptized and do you love more like jesus than you ever have before are you growing in those areas are you becoming more like jesus is this your prayer this morning oh to be like thee blessed redeemer this is my constant longing and prayer can we help you in your spiritual walk with jesus this morning as we stand together and as we sing Oh, to be like the blessed Redeemer, this is my constant longing and prayer. Glad we are forfeit all the treasures, Jesus my perfect righteous to wear. Oh, to be like the
We'd like to say again how much we appreciate your presence this morning. A special welcome again back to our college students. We're so glad that you're back with us. And our thanks to our men who led in our worship this morning. Thank you so much. Will you bow with me, please? Our dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful to you for being our God. And Father, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you and praise you this morning. And Father, we pray that each of us will rededicate ourselves to encouraging and helping each other to grow, and that our ultimate aim and commitment will be to be more like your Son. In Jesus' name, amen. 